While everyone's signing in, um, I'll welcome you all back again, everybody. Jen Watson here for your third, we're starting your third week in the um, Beaverworks Summer Institute program. Um, we've had two weeks of outstanding speakers and this week is gonna be no less than excellent as well. Today, we are very fortunate to have two speakers, one representing industry. Um, we have Jennifer Benton from Raytheon's Intel Intelligence and Spaces Advanced Concepts and Technologies Mission Area. Um, Jennifer is the product line chief engineer for advanced electro electronics and optics. Um, she has a bachelor's degree um, in mechanical engineering from Northeastern University and a master's degree in engineering management. She's gonna give you a talk today on advanced optical systems and AI and machine learning um, applied to those topics. And following Jennifer, we are extremely fortunate to have Major General Michael Schmidt coming to, to speak to you today from Hanscom Air Force Base. So Major General Schmidt is the Program Executive Officer um, for Command Control Communications and Intelligence Networks here at Hans Hanscom Air Force Base, right, right here in Massachusetts. Major General Schmidt is responsible for more than 2,600 employees and um, the acquisition of a $12.1 billion portfolio that's involved in developing advanced technology in a wide variety of areas, including <clears throat> joint and coalition cyberspace um, and uh, cryptologic and data links, as well as several special specialized uh, programs. He has a bachelor's degree from um, the University of Iowa, of Iowa, and he has a very distinguished career in the military, and he's gonna tell you a lot about his experiences and how technology fits in, um, in the DOD. So um, again, I encourage all of you to please take this opportunity to ask questions of these leaders in, in, the, in these technology fields. This is a very unique opportunity to have their ear and to really get their first-hand perspective. So please enter your questions in the chat and um, I'll, at the appropriate time, I'll call on you for questions. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you for being here, both Jennifer and General Schmidt. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are at this morning. <laughs> um, as she mentioned, my name is Jennifer Benson. I am a chief engineer at Raytheon. And I really appreciate you guys having the time uh, to talk about a couple of the technologies that I find very cool uh, that I, I get to work on right now and our team. Um, so next slide, um, a little bit about me. Um, so we, all of you are spending your summer here, uh, you know, taking a course. Uh, so I bet your pretty high percentage of you want a career in STEM. Um, when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to be an engineer also. I loved math science, but most importantly, I really liked taking things apart so I could figure out how to put them back together. My career has been a journey. Uh, I actually went to college thinking I was going to work on combustion engines and cars or on jet aircraft and jet engines. But instead, I spent the past 10 years working in electro optics and infrared, uh, or EOIR for short. With that, I got to work on really complex mechanisms, uh, and I learned about optics and sensors. So you may ask, how did that happen? Well, I took an opportunity with Raytheon as an internship, and it exposed me to completely new areas of technology. And now I'm in the advanced electro-optics group in our advanced concepts and technologies business. Today, there are so many different technologies, and I'm only going to talk about a very, very small subset, but I just want you to be aware of how broad our science and technologies can be and be open to trying and learning new things. And that was the biggest thing, uh, opportunity I had while going to school and then now in my career. I'm not gonna lie though, engineering is hard. Uh, in college, there were some topics that I picked up very quickly, and I'm sure many of you are, are brilliant, right? So you get that really quickly, uh, classes, and then there may be a few that you struggle with, or maybe you will going forward in your careers. My biggest advice there is dig in, do not quit. There will be tough classes. Uh, find a peer, find a mentor, find someone who's strong in an area that you 
not only developing new technologies, but then turning those into products that we can not easy. Uh, it's just as hard as, uh, as anything. So every day is a challenge and I really, really, really enjoy that aspect about it. So this next clip uh, you're gonna see is from the movie Transformers. Uh, look for the multispectral targeting system or MTS for short. It's a sensor on the UAV. Uh, it's one of the products I got to work on over the past 10 years. And it, this gives you an example of its surveillance mission. Put it on the main screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Predator 01. Commence Operation Firestorm. Send everyone. Get those okay, boys. This is Warlord Roland Strike Packages Alpha. Task Force River. Execute landing. Um, it's from a movie. It's from Transformers, and it shows the multispectral targeting system, which, like I said, is one of the products uh, EOIR products I got to work on. And it's pretty cool uh, that one of the products became a movie star. Uh, that's what I find uh, really enjoying. You know, every day is fun. Uh, and so moving to the next chart, then on this uh, is a little more on Raytheon technology where it has taken me. Uh, I've had an opportunity to live in multiple areas as a chief engineer or as an engineer for Raytheon. And looking at this graphic here, you see the United States and all of the different sites that Raytheon has across the US, as well as some international sites as well. Uh, the big technology developed all across the United States and, and all over the world. So it's not specific to one area. Um, so if you're in an area that has, you know, you wanna be near family or there's an area you wanna live in, know that there's probably technologies being developed in that area. All right, so here you see our key technologies for Raytheon Intelligence in Space. It should be no surprise, there are a lot of them as we're a technologies company. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly discuss two areas that I think are pretty interesting and how they tie into advanced EO. So resilient communications, more specifically laser communications. Uh, Optical comms has actually been around for a while. If you have a Blu-ray player, it uses laser comms. When you scan barcodes at the checkout line, that's a version of optical communications. And if you have fiber optic for phone or internet service, that's uh, optical communication as well. But we want laser comms to be direct, point to point communication. It's not broadcast then. And it, with high throughput, over vast distances. The concepts are to go from ground to space, ground. And these are gonna be upwards of distances of more than a thousand kilometers. But as you see, how do we get there? For example, and other optical turbulence from the atmosphere. Think of a day when you're at the beach or there's a large asphalt road. Refraction or the bending of light from the temperature difference between the ground and the air ends up disrupting the light that's transmitted to your eyes or a camera, and you get that wavy effect. Hopefully most of you have seen this. That same effect can break up the optical laser signal and reduce the signal in the beam. This distortion will create losses and data errors. And as you can imagine, the longer the distance you have to go, the more distortion we're going to see. There are a lot of challenges for us to solve here to get to this point for laser communications. But this is gonna mean a lot of innovation, advancements, and new technologies. My team actually recently demonstrated a new technology where we transmitted high definition video across the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. We broadcast over 16 kilometers through rough atmospheric conditions at a rate of one gigabit per second. But the plan here is to push from 16 kilometers to satellite distances. And where we are today, data rates, data rates up to 10 or even 100 gigabits per second. 
So well past where LTE takes us today. I find this area, in, area of technology really cool and there's gonna be a lot of interesting things that will come out of it. So on the next slide, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about this. The biggest thing I see as we move forward as a technologies company is we develop some really high-end, great sensors. And they're all out there all over the world collecting data. But with creating all this data, the, it, we're creating information overload for our users. So how do we sift through terabytes of data? How do we augment and help our operators do their jobs? Well, this area is a growing technology area. Nearly a billion was invested in 2020 by the DOD. And in the commercial sector, specifically in the automotive businesses, they quadrupled investments since 2013. There are multiple types of AI ML. We have semantic web, machine learning, and then deep AI learning. But each one of these requires significant processing. We're talking about developing small and much lower power microelectronics in order to process all of these vast amounts of data. So each of you should have received your Arduino microcontroller. These are extremely power efficient and fun for projects. Um, hopefully this will give you a glimpse of some things you can do with it and related to AIML as well. Another aspect that we're going to need with AIML is a deep math knowledge and skill set. Terabytes and terabytes. Now I'm sure many of you may be asked AI. Well, this is why the DOD has funded a program called Explainable AI. It's going to ask the question, how does AI get to that decision and why do we trust it? This is going to involve deep layers of learning with layers upon layers. I am not an AI ML SME myself, but as a sensor and EOIR SME, I technology advancements going forward because we just keep collecting more and more data. So I've talked very, very briefly and just skimmed the surface on a couple of cool technologies. But what's next? Well, you are all here because you are smart, innovative, and you enjoy STEM. Innovation is driven by problems most of the time. So for example, a Raytheon engineer noticed a candy bar melt while working on some radar technology, which later resulted in the microwave. Uh, another great example that happened about seven years ago, in 2013, the Kiska Sea was a crab fishing vessel, and it was trapped in iceberg infested waters in the Arctic. The National Weather Service turned detailed imagery that was captured by one of our Raytheon, which orbits the Earth 14 times a day. With this information, they collected and mapped weather and environmental conditions so that they could reveal a path of safety for this crab fishing vessel. But of course, why we're all virtual today is COVID, and that's causing us to innovate. Specifically, BBN, which is another group in our advanced concepts and technologies business, is developing an inexpensive test that will use saliva to rapidly diagnose COVID. So imagine the ability to go back to school, you walk in, you swab with a paper test strip, and you get a reliable diagnosis in 30 to 45 minutes. This could be a game changer for us moving forward with this pandemic. And all of this without the fun, complex extraction procedures, labs, or test equipment that the test requires today. But that's one aspect. The really cool thing I found out with this is that it was based on a tool originally developed to detect malware in network traffic. We're talking cyber, not biology. Instead of detecting bad code on a network, we look for viruses' unique RNA sequences. So imagine being that cyber specialist who created this and now had to learn the pH of spit for the test strip. This is a great example. 
of diversity with teams. Multiple skill sets and knowledge to solve these problems, both biology and cyber. BBN is the same group that is also hiring three BeaverWorks students for a summer internship in 2021 in Cambridge. This is our third year hiring interns from BeaverWorks students. Last year, for example, one intern helped evaluate and integrate new sensing technologies for autonomy and functionality to improve dr drone swarm reliability and base capabilities. While another student got to intern and help integrate machine learning, like I was just talking about, in artificial intelligence and capabilities to suit a moving map situational awareness tools used for both military and civilian needs. Some pretty fun stuff to do in an internship. <laughs> so innovation is about what is fun with science, technology, engineering, and math. And like I said, every day is different and there are problems to solve. We just need to be adaptable enough to find and fix them. I know I briefly touched on these topics and I'm happy to answer any questions. I wanna thank you for your time and hopefully this barely scratches the itch for exposure to different and new technologies. Your careers are going to be a journey. Be open to these new things. Remember to bring diversity into your problem solving and having fun. So as you guys saw, right, the UAV flying, it has a sensor on it and it collects imagery, uh, which is one of the things I've worked on for quite a while. Uh, it uses optics, it has different sensors from the visible, the sphere, uh, mid-wave infrared, even long-wave infrared, uh, to take data and, and surveil an area to help um, provide information for our users. But like I mentioned, that's a large amount of data and we're talking about one sensor when there's lots of those out there, we're asking operators to have to um, sift through a lot of that. And that's where AIML is gonna be. I mean, there's multiple applications for AIML, but specifically from an EO perspective, that's gonna be a huge aspect of it. So Jennifer, I'm, I'm, I'll pause here for a second. Sure, so I, I, maybe we could take one question now. Absolutely. And then, so why don't we, um, up, up Nara, would you be willing to ask your question? Yeah. It's actually Aparna. So I root. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. So anyway, I actually love your presentation on research and how you guys were able to um, sift through like cyber data for our other research projects. I just want to ask, like, have you guys had any success with research on detecting COVID nineteen, and what are the methods you guys use in order to handle like huge clusters of cyber data with cyber tools? So I think I, sorry, my connection's not fantastic. I think I heard most of that, um, specifically on the, the test strip, right, for COVID-19. So yeah, um, it's, it's in development right now. Um, we're hopeful that we should be able to continue to work with our partners there and have something out here shortly. Um, that's one of the things that obviously BBN is, and as an industry we're doing to help with that. Uh, there are some other things going on um, not everything that I can talk about at this point, but uh, it's a it's a real issue right now, right? It's why we're all virtual, um, and it, you know, as a as a mechanical engineer, I can't imagine being a cyber engineer that now has to work with spit and biology from that perspective. So it's taking those things that you learn uh, and applying them to new areas, which is what a lot of us are doing right now with COVID. Thank you. Of course. Excellent, thank you, Jennifer. Um, Lisa, should we, um, yeah. do you invite the students, please? So Simon Traub and Karen Song will be virtually presenting. So Simon, do you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, hi, first off, I wanna thank you for sending in this uh, really cool Arduino kit. Uh, Beaverworks is eating up a lot of my time right now. But as soon as the program ends, I can't wait to start working on it. Awesome. I, also, I also want to thank you, of course, for uh, the great talk in particular. I liked when you talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning. In the course that I'm taking right now, we're learning a lot about neural networks. So it was really fascinating to hear you talk about kind of a 
really high level application of deep learning and how you're implementing that in Raytheon technologies. So once again, I just want to thank you for the Arduino kit and the great talk. And Karen Song. Mm -hmm. And going off of what Simon said, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today and you know sharing your presentation. And I know personally, I found it really fascinating how you guys at Raytheon are adapting new technologies for new uses, such as COVID detection, which is so critical right now. And even though we couldn't hear the audio, it was really cool to see the technology that you guys have been working on like in a movie, which was pretty cool. And especially as a Medlytics student, we're really grateful for Raytheon's support. And just, yeah, thank you for speaking with us today. Yeah, thank, thank you guys for the opportunity. I, you guys are, are brilliant and I'm so excited to see what you guys are gonna do in your careers uh, moving forward and the awesome technologies that I know you're all gonna develop. So uh, I can only, I'm, I'm just thrilled and excited every day to know that you guys are gonna come into this workforce and, and develop some amazing things. So with that, uh, I appreciate it. I would like to turn it over to Major General Schmidt uh, for him to uh, talk to you guys. Okay, uh, can you hear me all right, thumbs up? Um, thanks, Jennifer, and thanks to the, uh, the whole Beebleworks team. And uh, I wish I honestly had the opportunity to do what you all are doing when I was uh, your age. Uh, certainly, I, um, I have a different view of maybe my thoughts uh, when I was your age now than I did then. I, I luckily made some good choices, but, uh, but I don't know that I knew everything that I, that I do today. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about was my experiences and, and honestly what, uh, what STEM and what engineering did for me. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was um, you know, in middle school and high school, uh, I, was, I was pretty good at math and science. I, Engineering kind of intrigued me. Uh, I really wanted to be in the go in the military, and I wanted to be a fighter pilot, uh, and and that's kind of what drove me. And I knew that at the time, um, and really, and today, and always, uh, uh, taking an engineering path um, really uh, um, uh, made scholarships available to me in ROTC or at the academy. And it's the same with all the other services. Uh, and uh, by the way, in the government, uh, we have a lot of civilians. In fact, most of the people that I work with are government civilians and, and not military. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about that, that start. So I, I did make the decision to go to engineering. I went to Iowa State University and I graduated in industrial engineering. And, uh, and as I, after I graduated from college, a doctor told me, uh, an Air Force doctor, that I, uh, that I should not be flying. And so that was uh, problematic for me since I really wanted to be a fighter pilot. But, you know, I said, well, at least I had this engineering degree. Uh, uh, and um, and thank goodness I did, honestly, because I really felt like the, like, uh, the opportunities were still out there for me. I would just do the time I had to serve in the military for years and then uh, and get some good experiences and then, and then go do something else. Well, uh, so I asked for any beach in the southeast, and they said, well, you're going to go to Hanscom Air Force Base in Boston. And I said, wow, well, um, I didn't even know they had a base in Boston. Well, they do. It's a research and development base uh, focused on acquisition. And we have a number of them here focused on communications uh, at Eglin in Florida, focused on munitions. Uh, and then uh, really right passion, Ohio, focused on weapons. And then we have our, our space uh, uh, focus in, in Los Angeles and a bunch of other places around. But those are some key development centers. Uh, anyways, I got here to Boston and uh, and it's weird to be back after 30 years because that's where I am today. Um, but I got here and they they put me in charge of all the Navy programs as an engineer working this thing called JTIDS, Joint Tactical Information Distribution System, uh, which is a highly secure anti-jam radio that we still use today. It's how we talk uh, secretly between each other in missions between fighter planes and, and larger airplanes and people on the ground. And anyways, I got to, I got to work on all the Navy's programs as a, as a you know, fresh out of college. And the Air Force said, hey, you know what? We would like to pay for you to get your... Uh, your MBA, I, they would have paid for my engineering degree too, but I chose to, to get my, uh, my MBA. And, uh, and so they did that for me. And I, and I did start to notice that I was um, really enjoying this program management stuff. And I maybe wasn't as good an engineer as Jennifer is that, that, that you just heard from at Raytheon. And so uh, the Air Force allowed me to move, switch over to program management, which I really appreciated. 
But the fact I had that engineering degree still uh, stayed with me as something that the people who moved me into positions really appreciated that I had this engineering background. And they put me in charge of uh, actually the deputy uh, for, for uh, in the Joint Stars program to the Joint Strategic Targeted Attack Radar System. It's a big 707 old airplane that we tricked it out with a big uh, canoe on the bottom and a big radar, and we still have it in service today. And, uh, and I got to be in charge of the production for that, taking these old airplanes and putting all these uh, cool stuff on there. Um, so anyways, my four years was up and I had my MBA and, um, and I, but I said, this is too much fun. Uh, I really was enjoying it. So I, I entered this program called the Education with Industry Program. And I got to go to uh, Lockheed Martin uh, Fire and Missile Control in Orlando, Florida. That, that wasn't a rough assignment, I'll tell you that, and work on some really neat things. Uh, putting fire control systems, the, the things that uh, seek out targets and allow our weapons to hit the targets directly. Uh, working on, on uh, fighter aircraft there, uh, the sniper fire control system and the lantern fire control system. And again, I still really enjoyed the stuff that I was doing. And I said, but if I'm going to stay in, I want to work on the coolest program in the Air Force. And at the time, I thought the coolest program was the F-22 fighter jet being developed back then in the 90s. And, uh, and I bugged the guy who ran the program over and over until he finally hired me and I moved to Ohio uh, to work on the F-22. And they let me run the edges and empennage program. Uh, so working with a lot of stealth materials, a lot of integrated avionics, it was a really great, uh, great opportunity there. And, uh, and from there, um, somehow they decided to let me go be the aide to the four star in charge of all of our science and technology. And I traveled around the world with him. He's a great man named General Lester Lyles. And, uh, and I learned a lot from him, got to go uh, engage with the Congress a lot with him, uh, go travel all those bases, and, um, and I really enjoyed that. And, uh, and I also, like I said, I really enjoyed the congressional integration as aspect of that. And so that's what the, the Air Force let me do after that, was go work on Capitol Hill for three years uh, as an appropriations liaison and, uh, and a legislative liaison. Uh, really work in science and technology programs and then fighters, bombers, and weapons with the Congress. Again, my engineering degree kept, kept being there, something that people appreciated. I had the, the mix of technical and, and some other experiences. So that was, that was just a great, a, another great opportunity. I traveled back and forth with the Speaker of the House, uh, you know, uh, because it was after 9-11. He got a ride back and forth uh, every week, and, and, and that was very interesting. Uh, flying with him every week. I traveled with members of Congress around the world. And, uh, and again, another, another great experience. And I still think it's founded on my STEM background, all of these experiences uh, that, I, that I was allowed to have. And then you start to build up other experiences uh, as you go. And, and again, I, I just want to continue to remind you that, I, yes, I'm in the military, but we have an entire civilian side to what I do, especially in acquisition and, and, uh, and research and development. And you could have taken any, any path along the way there. You could have turned more towards what I did in the program management or more towards the lab side with many more opportunities to do really deep engineering like, uh, like Jennifer's team does at, at Raytheon. Uh, so anyways, after, uh, after uh, I got to work uh, with the Congress, um, I went in the Air Force to, to be the person in the Pentagon doing F-35 uh, uh, stuff, trying to get support for the F-35 and their budget and working through the Pentagon and that, and that was a great experience as well. And then they let me go to Eglin Air Force Base and run the entire next generation air-to-air -air missile program. Uh, it's, it was called the uh, AIM-120D at the time. It's a great missile that's out there today. And, and when people say, well, you know, I work, you know, he's a rocket scientist. I literally work with all of the men and women rocket scientists that you can possibly imagine. They really were literally rocket scientists, and it wasn't bad that we were all living on the beach near Destin, Florida. So that was a spectacular assignment as well uh, in developing and, and, uh, and testing those, those missiles, uh, and, uh, and I had an opportunity to travel a lot in that, in that job as well. And then they, they, uh, from there, I did go to Afghanistan, which actually was a wonderful experience for me. I mean, it's hard work. Uh, but I got to help the Afghan National Army figure out what they needed to buy for themselves. Really, we paid for a lot of it, but what they needed to buy to become a self-sustaining uh, military themselves. And so I did that. And then, uh, and then from there, I went to uh, this place called the National War College. Well, you should Google it sometime. It's one of the most beautiful schools 
uh, in the world, in my opinion, and this uh, it's in this place called Roosevelt Hall, uh, right in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I got my uh, another master's degree in national security strategy, and that was really cool. You get to meet the president, all the cabinet members, all reporters from uh, from uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Al Jazeera. You get to meet um, heads of, uh, of industry, of, of clergy, of, of companies. And it was just a whole year of an unbelievable learning experience uh, that I got out of, out of that. Uh, and then I got to come back and work uh, in the Pentagon again, working uh, all of the tactical uh, fighter aircraft programs in OSD as, as kind of the policy person under the Secretary of Defense working tactical fighter uh, things. And, uh, and then I got to go to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, another uh, great place if you've never been there. Um, it wasn't a place that was on my list of places I wanted to go, and it turned out to be a place we just loved. And uh, we went there, and I ran all of our commercial derivative aircraft programs for the Air Force. So think about an airplane that is uh, made commercially, uh, but then you trick it out with stuff to turn it into a military airplane. So like Air Force One was one of my airplanes, all of the 737s and the uh, and the Gulfstream airplanes, the blue and white that you see members of Congress and, and cabinet members flying around in and, and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, um, anyways, from there, I went to uh, US Special Operations Command. Um, and uh, in, uh, again, Tampa, Florida, not a bad place to be living on the beach. Um, and so uh, anyways, living on the beach and um, working all of our special operations programs for fixed wing related airplanes things. things. So I got to work with Jennifer's group there at Raytheon quite a bit on, uh, on uh, uh, multi-spectral targeting balls and uh, MTSAs and MTSBs and everything else that we were tricking out all of these airplanes uh, with to, to take, uh, to give to our soft warriors and deliver capability for them uh, to, to take into honestly into war. And, uh, and so it was, um, a really spectacular opportunity with such a great, great group of people. Uh, but the technology side of that was just fun. It was really, really enjoyable. Uh, um, the stuff that we could come up with in a short period of time and carve into an airplane and put it on there was great. And from there, the Air Force let me do the same thing, our special ops thing, uh, but on the Air Force side. So I was the program executive officer of all of the Air Force's intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and special operations programs. This was back in Ohio again, uh, and uh, and that was a great a great experience uh, uh, doing that. Uh, and then they, the Air Force gave me the opportunity to stay there in Ohio and run all of our fighter and bomber programs in the Air Force. Again, uh, uh, just a great experience uh, taking care of some really old airplanes, really old technology, and some really new airplanes with really new technologies. Uh, you know, when I went to the F-22 program way back when, we pressed the state of the art in the in the propulsion of their engine technology, in the stealth technology, in the integrated avionics, and the autonomic autonomic logistics. Thinking, you know, you want the airplane to tell you what's wrong with it before it lands, so people can be ready to start working on it. Anyways, those technologies we were pushing back in the 90s, and then the, the technologies we're working on today are absolutely incredible. Beyond that, uh, and so um, then the Air Force gave me the opportunity to come here. Uh, and this is, again, like I said, where I started many years ago uh, and, and run all of our command control, communications, intelligence, and networks programs. So think of all the Air Force cyber programs, all of our IT programs, all of our um, a, uh, aerial <clears throat> networking programs, uh, and uh, all of our cloud programs at all security levels. And then I have a whole bunch of classified programs as well. Uh, that, that are, it's just a really neat, broad portfolio of professionals. Now, I happen to live here at Hanscom Air Force Base, and a lot of, uh, some of my team is here, not quite half of them. I have a big team in San Antonio, a big team in Alabama, a big, a little team in Ohio, and then a smidgen of teams in Washington, D.C., and in California. And so, um, so we, we have, there are opportunities everywhere around the country. And, uh, and I guess, I, just to go full circle here, I truly believe that my decision to get an engineering degree, uh, which isn't necessarily what I, you know, I, I didn't know that I, if I wanted to be an engineer and be an engineer my whole life, uh, but it was the best decision ever for me to make that decision 
uh, way back when. And like I said, things don't always uh, work out the exact way that you think they're going to work out. But I'll tell you, when you have a STEM degree as kind of your baseline, no matter what it is that you want to go do, if you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a doctor, I don't care. Uh, if you have that STEM degree as your fallback, uh, you have something that will stick with you and that you will have for the rest of your life. So that's quick. That's uh, all I really wanted to get across today. And, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions and I'm sure Jennifer is happy to take any questions as well. Major General Schmidt, thank you very much. That was excellent. I'm sure the students really will get a lot from, um, you know, learning a lot about your experiences. Um, we do have a few questions and I think we'll start on the technical side. Um, David Lee, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, thanks for a wonderful um, talk about your uh, career through STEM and uh, the military. And uh, I was just wondering like what would the applications of AI and machine learning specifically be in maybe the Air Force, like for example, in the development of fighter jets, um, just like generally, what sort of applications would it have? Yeah, so there's all kinds of applications. So. So uh, I'll start with like our, in our cloud technology. So we are, we have, we are pushing all, a lot of our programs, both our business systems and our weapon systems to the cloud and, and applying AI and ML in ways that we've never done it before uh, allows us to take information. Sometimes I call it data weaponization, but allows us to take information that by itself doesn't mean a lot, but with those AI and ML tools and our ability to bring that data to one place or at least tag it and know where it is, it can create unbelievable kinds of advantages in intelligence uh, relative to our adversary. So there's definitely a big data side of uh, AI and ML that we're using. Also on the developing fighter jets and that kind of thing. So the, the, um, the future of digital engineering and our ability to, you know, before, you know, I was an industrial engineer, we focused on tight tolerances and all that kind of stuff. But the, the kind of tolerances we can get today in a digital engineering environment that where we can make an exact replica with AI and ML put on top of digital, uh, uh, digital models of our, um, our aircraft allows us to, um, in the future, build airplanes much faster and much more, um, with, with much greater colleges than we ever could before and, and hopefully uh, require a lot less test, a lot less variance from airplane to airplane. And so, so there's a huge um, advantage to using AI and ML in the uh, development environment within our airplanes. It also lets us try out all kinds of new designs without actually having to build these designs. And you can imagine how much, how much money and time that can save us in developing that next generation uh, aircraft. Great. We have another question um, from Mike Wimmer on drones. Michael, would you like to ask your question, please? First, I want to say thank you for coming. I really appreciate your discussion about how the engineering degree really did change your life in the military. I've worked with uh, the Army Division of USS, and there's a lot of talk about UAS and drone development. How do you think that will affect what happens in the Air Force with fighter jets? So, I mean, that's a really good question and it's an ongoing uh, debate. I, I, uh, I think there will always be a place for the human in the airplane. Um, there's, a, there's a political side of that uh, and as well as a, a um, you know, we, we still are more comfortable with people making decisions in the cockpit where it really matters, I think, than elsewhere. Uh, but, that, but not everybody agrees with that, for sure. We have moved to a place where there's a lot of things that we are going to be uh, doing in, 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 a, uh, uh, in an, an environment where we don't have a human in a cockpit. And, and so there are, there are a lot of opportunities, I still think, both in the, in the manned and the unmanned aircraft side of things. Um, and certainly the Army has their role. The Army uses theirs a little differently than we do. We, we both have a role in the different sizes of, of UAVs. And, uh, but, but there's going to be a big future for, uh, for UAVs uh, for the coming future and, and counter UAVs as well, because our adversaries are, are getting them as well. So. Great, thank you. Um, now we have a question from Charlotte related to optics. Charlotte, optical communications. Charlotte, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. 
So I was wondering what the uh, security of the optics communication is compared to like standard forms of communication. You want me I, to take I, that one? I, I'd like Jennifer take that one, yeah. Thank you. So, that is a great question and that's where uh, optical communication or laser comm specific comes into play. So you think about Wi-Fi or your cell phones, right? Uh, those signals are broadcast, they're very broad. Uh, and so they can get picked up on. Uh, with a laser communication, think of a laser pointer. If you have one of those and you point it at a spot on the wall, you're gonna hit that spot. Uh, and so when you put the message in that spot, it will transverse just that direction. So uh, from, a, from a secure perspective, right, it's point to point communication um, without that broadcast uh, capability. So it's, it, it should be pretty secure and will be secure from that perspective. Great. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, and now Evelyn has questions um, more generally on working in the DOD. Evelyn, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Sure. My question was like working with um, things like autonomous drones. How often do you have to deal with ethics and integrating AI machine learning with military technology and how do you deal with those problems? So if, if that's for me, um, certainly those are things that we think about all of the time. Um, you know, nobody, uh, so the military, our military is, is designed, uh, especially our active duty uh, military, to present forces and capabilities over our sea, overseas uh, or, you know, uh, outside the continental United States. And, um, and so that, those are really good questions and really hard ones. Do we, um, our public does not want to take, you know, our great te Raytheon technologies, uh, for instance, and spy on our own people. It's just something that we, uh, that we don't do. So, um, so those are really good questions. I think every one of them needs to be answered. Um, there's, there's concerns relative to ethics in, in you know, uh, the future of laser technology, the future of, of uh, uh, nuclear technology and nuclear weapons. And this debate has been going on for, for many, many, many years. And um, uh, it's a good question. It's, it's a hard one and every one, every case is different. And I honestly, things tend to change a little bit over time. Excellent. Okay, we have a, another question now from Aiden Melvin on your ROTC experience. Aiden, could you unmute and ask your question, please? Oh, um, I heard that you said that uh, you participated in ROTC when you were younger, and I was just wondering how does participation in that program uh, affect how many other activities and classes that you can do uh, during your time in college? So that is a really good question. Um, so I just honestly, personally, um, did not participate in as much of the ROTC activities as some of my friends did. So I was in ROTC since I was a freshman, and, and uh, uh, but I was an engineer, and that takes some time. I was in a fraternity. Uh, I like to play intramural sports. Um, you know, I like to do a lot of things. So I, I was, um, I was involved in ROTC. You know, two days a week or so. Some people got much more involved in ROTC uh, because there's a lot of really neat programs in ROTC. But I did not take advantage of those because I really wanted to do a lot of the other things uh, in college. And I, I think that's the best part about ROTC is, um, you know, they kind of have a flavor for someone who really wants to, to have their social life and a lot of their life in college revolve around ROTC, participate in drill, participate in halftime of the football games, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also the side of that, which is, you know what, they're there to train you to be an officer in the, in the military and there's the, the things that are absolutely required to do that that you need to do and the rest, you know, they, they, uh, um, they were good with me having a, you know, a, uh, a little more balanced, uh, less, less a military college uh, career from ROTC standpoint. So I, I would tell you that there's a lot of flexibility there uh, for you, um, kind of depending on which college you, you go to, but most colleges, uh, there's a lot of flexibility for you relative to ROTC. Great. Um, we have another question uh, kind of reflecting on some of your experiences that may have been challenges. Uh, Catherine, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Uh, you want me to ask my question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I asked, uh, have you ever joined a project where you felt out of place or didn't quite understand what was going on in it? And how did you deal with that if you have? So if that's for me, 
It happens all the time, right? You know, think about, you know, I just said I went to Special Operations Command and run all those programs, uh, the airplane programs. I went to ISR and SOF. I went to fighters and bombers, and I came here. And my wife tells me I'm the, I was the least uh, qualified person in the world to be running all the networks for the United States Air Force. So a lot of it is about just getting in there and being willing to listen and knowing that you have smart people around you, like Jennifer, uh, and, uh, and, you know, depending on what your job is, um, you know, if you're there to be the, the um, uh, mechanical engineer, you're going to bring those mechanical engineering skills and the programs, you'll kind of figure out what there is. If you're there to be the program manager, you're, you're going you're gonna to figure out what's going on and who, who to work with. It's really about leading teams of technical people. And, uh, and it's about leading your peers, which is different than leading people who have to listen to you. It's much harder to lead people who don't have, have to listen to you than to lead people that have to listen to you. And so, um, and that, this whole acquisition thing about getting the defense industry and our teams and all the skills, whether you're an engineer, a program manager, a financial manager, a contracting officer, all together um, to, to build something, but, but you know, that is a really good question because there's many times where I've walked in saying, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but the truth is if you're just willing to, to listen to other people and work with our great teammates, uh, military and civilian for us in the government, uh, it, it, uh, it's really a, a fun experience. So along the same lines, um, we have a question on what has made you become a better leader from Madeline. Madeline, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Yeah, sure. So this is probably um, applicable to both of our presenters, but I definitely thought of it during the Major General's presentation. So I'm just curious, considering the different leadership positions that you've described, um, what experiences or at least type of experiences have you had that you feel have helped you develop your leadership sk skills and become a better leader? Yeah, I, for me personally, I would just say um, really being open-minded and and diversity of thought you know when when you know when i was a young second lieutenant here my first time you know i kind of thought that uh in some areas i kind of knew it all and and uh and it was a, a you know it took me a while to realize that we're a you're we're a much better leader if we really try to understand all of the people that we work with and spend a little time doing that um and uh and that that probably is the thing that I've learned the most. And, and what I said before about being able to lead your peers, um, you know, if, if they don't want to listen to you, you're not going to get very far, you know. And, and most people don't like to be told what to do or, or told how to do something. You know, it's got to be a collaborative environment. So as a leader, I try very hard to set up an environment that is collaborative. Uh, but at some point, someone's got to make a decision. And then you, you know, then you step up and you make a decision. But... Uh, I, I think, I hope anyone on, on any one of my teams would say, I want to hear what every single person has to say before we make a decision. And there are no dumb answers and no dumb questions. There's so many times you're sitting in a room uh, where, I, where you won't answer, ask the question because you don't want someone to, to you know, think you don't, you know, that it's a dumb question. And the truth is, almost, if you're even thinking about it, I'll bet you there's 10 other people sitting right there saying, thinking about asking the same question. So there are no dumb questions. And that's, uh, and that's uh, something else I guess I've taken along. So I ask a lot of questions. So Madeline, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Um, as a leader, right, and, and in the technology and engineering, um, the you know teams are smart. They uh, have a lot of different capabilities. And the biggest thing as a leader that I can do is block and tackle the barriers that they're going to face um, to help them. Really, it's, it's digging in and letting them do their jobs. And when they need help, uh, I'm there to help them, right? I'm not there to tell them what to do. They're smart. They know what to do. Uh, I'm just there to help them. And that's really the big thing about leadership. This is great. Um, we have another question from Drake on some challenges in leading remotely. Drake, would you like to ask your question? Hello, uh, thank you for talking, or thank you for talking to all of us. Uh, as you've come into leadership of projects that are further away from where you, you are currently at, and I would assume that you would have to use some sort of, uh, or you would have to use the internet to some extent in order to communicate with 
people far away. Uh, has modern technology really allowed that to become so easy that it's not an issue at all compared to if you had all of your projects the same amount, but just all right near you, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say um, uh, sometimes it, it's nice to have you know, your projects near you. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, having the diversity again in, in, in having projects in different areas, because in certain parts of our country, we can't, um, we can't, uh, there's not enough talent to do all of the things we want to do in other par parts there's more of that certainly this COVID time has helped us uh feel a little more like we can communicate uh there's a lot of technologies out there that we've adopted too in fact my team has done for the air force uh and i'm very proud of them for for uh, a lot of the technologies that they've really helped bring out over the COVID environment times uh, but we also have um we have video teleconference capabilities. We have classified video teleconference capabilities at all kinds of security levels. Uh, so we do have a lot of that technology. I would say that we always, we were on a lot of airplanes flying around to all of these locations, uh, probably too much. And we've learned from COVID, maybe we don't need to travel around quite as much as we did. So there's always a, I think there's an advantage if you actually know the person that's on the other end of the phone or the other end of the of the Zoom or whatever it is uh, that you know them, uh, and then uh, then this kind of communication works works uh, even better. But we're learning that uh, uh, I think geographical dispersity is is a very little um, matter in developing a weapon system or in or developing a business system or or whatever it may be. So just my thoughts there. But good question. Jennifer, do you want to maybe add a little bit from your perspective as working in the remote area as well? Sure. So I think the first thing I'll say is email does not solve everything. Uh, so phone communication or Zoom communication or whatever it is now, uh, having that interaction, being able to verbally talk something out is a really important aspect with a team. So I've got teams in the Virginia area as well as in California and Texas. Uh, and so we talk on a regular basis and, and that collaborative environment like the Major General is stating, um, being able to brainstorm off of each other and build on each other, uh, you can't do via email, right? You just can't. And so, you know, Zoom or phone calls, right? Teleconferences that we've been doing a lot of now uh, with being remote are, are extremely important to keep everyone connected. That's great. Well, I can't thank both of you enough for being here today and for taking your time to, to speak with the students at Beaverworks and for your support of the program. Um, your thoughts have been amazing and I, clearly inspirational to the students. Um, at, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to recognize two students to say a special thank you. Yeah, it's great. Um, so we are looking for David Lee and Advika. So David, we'll let you go first. Hi, I'm Major General Schmidt. Uh, again, uh, thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, and it was really interesting uh, uh, to hear about how like, just how like an engineering degree goes like, like, like a huge distance in terms of um, basically progressing and getting opportunities. And um, it's brought you all around the world from Afghanistan and Capitol Hill um, on to the Pentagon. And uh, Thanks so much. It was really interesting listening um, to uh, your thoughts about um, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the Air Force. And uh, uh, once again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was an honor to have you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Um, Avika? Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for giving us this talk today. Um, I really enjoyed listening to the insight on your personal experiences and the journey that you went through to get to where you are. Um, it was very fascinating to hear about your variety of experiences and all the different projects that you were a part of. Um, I'd also like, I also really liked how you highlighted the importance of your engineering degree and your background in STEM and how that had such an important impact on your life. So um, thank you so much. It was very inspirational. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the opportunity to wear something other than my camouflage uniform today. <laughs> Thank you again um, sincerely for, for your work and for your help with Beaverworks today. Thank you. So